And also you'll notice that this cover is painted 2150 red. That will almost double the strength of this transfer case. It's like putting stickers on stuff. If you put stickers on it, it goes faster. 2150 red makes it stronger. What's going on YouTube? Levi at Old Iron Off-Road here today with another video. We're gonna build ourselves a rock crawler. It's been a lot of years since we've had something that we could take to the trail and bash on. Yeah, we've got the side-by-side, -side, but it's really just not the same. And I feel like it's time to get back in the game. We're putting the band back together. There's a couple of us international guys that used to wheel together and we're all actively trying to build a crawler or already have a crawler. I've actually been assembling some parts and pieces. We're building a Scout 800, 4.3 liter V6, 4L80, full manual reverse valve body, built Dana 300, Dana 60 front, 14 bolt rear, 456 gears locked front and rear, obviously. Gonna set it on 39 and a half inch, 40 inch tires, something like that. Um, but yeah, we have most of the components here. We have the truck, we have the axles, we have the transmission, we have the transfer case, and we have some parts to go in the transfer case. So that's actually what we're gonna be doing today. Today's video is regarding the Dana 300. I've actually already built one of these for another customer, and after I built it, I just really, really felt like I needed one, so here we are. Uh, we've got a JB Fab, or a JB Conversions, I'm sorry, a JB Conversions four to one gear set. We've got the 32 spline rear output. We've got the 32 spline front output. And we also have a, obviously we've got the adapter for the 4L80. And then we have a big nasty TDS, TDI, TDS. I'll show you in the video, I'm not sure who it is, but a big nasty billet machine diff cover that's actually supposed to somewhat act as a case girdle for the Dana 300. Now I would call this an ultimate Dana 300 build, but now as of recently, there's a company called Midnight Metalworks, I believe that has came out with a billet machine Dana 300 case. Technically that would be the ultimate Dana 300. Um, at this point in time, I'm not dropping that kind of coin on a case. But today's video, we're focusing on getting the Dana 300 torn down. We're gonna clean it up, paint the case, and we're gonna start throwing some fancy parts in it. But first, let's go outside. Let's dig through some junk, see what we can come up with. Ooh. It's cold out here. Where'd this stuff come from? I'm over it. Oh, almost broke my ankle. Super secret ninja stash. Here is the little jewel that we're going to be building, all snow covered, and you can't really tell what's going on with it. This was purchased from a, a buddy of mine, um, GRC Fab, out of Cleveland, Georgia. He had this truck and um, actually an employee of his had been working on this thing. This is two trucks, it was a younger boy. This truck was two trucks, it got clipped in half and kind of two sections slid together. Um, it's not great, but it's pretty good and it is perfect to beat on. So over here, we have a 2001 4.3 liter v6 it is good running engine 130,000 miles i think and then we've got an early model 4l80 stash back here but i was super happy when he pulled this uh tranny up is there is actually a jasper reman tag and the fluid was super clean and i would imagine that it's fairly fresh so we're gonna throw a full manual reverse valve body in this guy and make things happen. So on to over here. Don't be looking at my junk pile either. You guys be showing up at my house wanting, wanting pieces and parts and stuff. These are mine. I've hoarded these my entire life. This is actually a CUCV takeout axle, or not a takeout, this is actually a, a military surplus CUCV front axle. It's pretty much brand new. Nothing's ever, it's never even been put in a truck. It's still got the, the plugs for the end of the hubs. And then we've got a 14 bolt that's fairly fresh with 456 gears in it as well. 
I don't know if I'm going to shave the 14 bolt or if I'm just going to turn it into a 13 bolt. I haven't quite decided that yet. Another option. Now I'm not completely against this. This may happen. I don't know. I've got this really weird width Dana 70 setting here. And I'm seriously considering cutting this guy down and turning it in into a front axle. Maybe. I don't know. We'll see if I decide to throw the money at it. So yeah, over here we've got our pile of Dana 300s. Got a couple of them to couple of them to choose from. I'm gonna dig through these guys and get a clean one, get it loaded into a wheelbarrow, and get it in the shop. All right, so we got one of these 300s in the shop. We're gonna go ahead and drain the fluid and get this thing torn down. There's not anything really weird about tearing one of these cases down. The only thing that's even remotely difficult is there is a gear that and a bearing that have to be pressed out through the case you have to have a bearing splitter inside of the case and actually have to put the case and everything in a press to get it out it's just kind of kind of difficult to jig up it's not hard at all um, and another thing you want to be aware of is when you are knocking the intermediate shaft for the center gear out that you drive it out towards the rear of the case you don't want to drive it out towards the front because these holes are actually different diameter and you can damage the case if you drive it out the wrong way so with that being said let's get this thing torn down pressed out of the case. So pretty much at this point, all we like is getting this case cleaned up, painted, looking pretty. We can start unboxing some of the other parts that we have and start slamming this thing back together. All right, so we got some paint on the case drying. I've got the instructions for the uh, Lomax install and the front and rear outputs printing. There's like five million pages. So hopefully we don't run out of paper or my printer jam, which seems to be a common occurrence. I hate printers. I really, really hate printers. Anyway, so what I thought I would do real quick is give you a quick side-by-side -side comparison of the stock output. So you can get a feel for how much beef the the 32 spline upgrades actually add to the overall strength of the of the transfer case so first up we have the front output stock 32 spline you can see that it carries the same diameter all the way down to this surface where it necks down and this is typically where you would have a failure either here at the base of the splines or right here Again, this is the front. I mean, you can tell that wins. And here's the rear. Stock, not so stock. This one, this one, this one makes me happy. All right, so first things first, we are also doing the 4L80 conversion as I'd mentioned. So a couple of things have to happen first. We have a new front input shaft housing and we have a new front input shaft that is the required spline count for the 4L80. We're actually gonna have to disassemble this old input housing to rob a few pieces off of it. We need this snap ring and there is also another clip ring that goes inside of this groove here. So we're gonna tear this guy down, get those pieces that we need. And we're also gonna press this new sealed bearing onto the new input shaft. And these two pieces are literally the only two pieces that we need out of this old input shaft housing. 
So we've got our housing all cleaned up and empty. One thing we end up having to do is we actually have to take a little bit out of this case on the front edge. This is the front input side on the, this edge here. We have to clearance a little bit of this case out to allow the intermediate gear to roll in as it's a little bit bigger than the factory. So we'll go ahead and cut that out, get any metal that we get into the case cleaned up again, and we'll be ready to start putting this thing together. So next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna set up the rear output. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna check some clearance between the rear output gear and the thrust washer. Now this thrust washer is specific to which direction it goes, so pay attention to that. Hopefully you can see here, there's actually a bevel on the inside of this thrust washer, and that needs to go towards the shoulder of the input shaft. And then what you're actually doing is you wanna check and make sure that there is clearance between the thrust washer and the gear once the thrust washer is sitting on the shoulder. So we've got eight thou of clearance between the shoulder of that, between the thrust washer and the face of the gear. So we've got this gear that goes in the case. We've got the rear output shaft that goes into the case. And then we've got this thrust washer again. Pay very close attention to the direction of the thrust washer. Put that guy on. And then now we've got, just verify our rear output housing. This inner bearing, we're going to drop this guy over the shaft. We're gonna take it over to the press. We're gonna press that guy on. All right, so we have our output shaft and first gear assembled in the case with the, with the proper thrust washer. The next piece that goes on is you've got a snap ring retainer here that holds the speedo gear in place. This guy, speedo gear drops on. You've got another thrust washer that has a bevel on it also. Bevel needs to go towards the shaft. And from there, you can build your shim stack to achieve the proper in play on the back of this rear output, which is gonna be zero to one and a half thousandths. That's no in play to a very little bit of in play. You do not want preload on this thing, guys. You want in play. So keep that in mind when you're setting this thing up. So I am going to go ahead and get this guy bolted up. We're also running a uh, Tom Woods 1350 uh, CV flange on the back. I'm gonna get this guy bolted up with a couple of shims, check the in place, see where we're at, and then adjust from there. So we've got our dial, dial indicator set up and it looks like I'm getting about maybe a half of a thousandth of in play in this. The best thing I can tell you to do when setting one of these things up is actually take it way too loose. Like say, get yourself four thousandths of in play and then slowly incrementally work that down until you lessen the in play until it's almost not even noticeable in the dial indicator. And then again, another good indication too is when you turn the bearing, there should be very minimum rolling resistance on that bearing. So we've got that set up, I believe. I've actually got to change this seal out because I'm running a different yoke or flange than what comes with the kit. So I'm gonna get this guy swapped out and we can actually button up the rear output and put the front input on. All right, so with the input and the rear output put together and in the case, we can actually start on the front output which is gonna require a little bit of work since we're doing the 32 spline upgrade to the front output as well. 
The 32 spline front output utilizes a larger bearing and obviously a larger seal to accommodate the larger shaft diameter. So a couple of things we're gonna to have to do is we're actually gonna to have to take this front bearing housing and take it to a machine shop and we're gonna have this guy punched out. Now the kit comes with specific measurements and directions as far as the machining goes. So just print that off and take that guy to your local machine shop. Um, we're gonna take the shift rails out of this guy and get this thing ready to go to the machine shop. All right, so we've got the shift rails, the poppet balls and springs out of the housing. And as far as tearing these things down goes, it's pretty simple. Uh, we'll actually lock this one back in place. Now you have a ball and spring pushing on the detent on the shaft and you have an interlock pill in between the two. Um, so what I do is pull the rear output all the way forward, pull the front output all the way forward, take a drift, put in this hole and rotate it. Do the rear first, the rear sl will slide right out, rotate the front over, slide it out, and then pick the poppet ball and springs out with a magnet. But yeah, this guy's torn down and we're gonna knock these seals out, knock this race out and it'll be ready to take to the machine shop and get this bearing punched out. Once we get it back from the machine shop, we'll be able to slam this guy back together and call it a day. All right, so we got our parts back from the machine shop. We've got our front bearing retainer punched out for the larger bearing, and we're actually gonna attempt to put this guy together. Uh, I don't know how much we're gonna get done today because today is race day. We've got it paused right now so that uh, the noise in the background isn't bothering us, but uh, we'll be watching that throughout the day, so progress may be lacking. Anyway, like I said, we've got the bearing retainer back from the machine shop. Two things that we want to discuss, or one thing we want to discuss, not two. One thing we want to discuss with this is uh, a potential problem that you run into with the four to one conversion and the twin stick conversion, which on this one, we're running both. On the Dana 300 and the Dana 20, the rear output has the potential to pop out of gear. Now, you can buy a heavy-duty detent spring and shim kit from JB Conversions, and that's one way to help solve the issue. Or, I actually found a website with a lot of information and kind of came up with my own shim set using this guy's math and some of the things that he kind of figured out. Now, you're running two springs. There are two different spring tensions, and... Because math, there are a couple of different uh, shim stack sizes that you can use. So I've cut a piece of 5 16 bar stock to a specific measurement. We're going to drop this in the bore for the poppet balls and springs, and this is going to act as a shim, basically a raised spring pressure. So pretty simple the way this works. You can see that the shift rails have these detents cut into them. The ball kind of locks into these as it's selected. You've got a spring that puts pressure on the ball, and then you've got basically this shim that's sitting in the bottom of the bore that again is gonna help raise spring pressure. So reasonably easy uh, to kind of understand what's going on. So we are going to go ahead and put the shift rails back in this guy, and then we'll start throwing the rest of the case together. So we got the transfer case set up in the press. We've got it kind of hanging off here with just a jack stand supported underneath it. It's a little, a little precarious to get it all in there and happy. So, and there's definitely a, an order to putting this guy together. So you got your shaft, or your, I'm sorry, you got your gear that you've got to set in the case. And you don't want to forget this guy. Don't do like I did on the last one forget to put this dude on there because you'll be upset when you got to go back and take it apart to put it on. And then you're going to set this stuff through the hole. And 
and we're going to we've got our race and our bearing we're going to support this guy we've got our bearing and our race we're going to support this guy inside of the case this bridges the gap across the hole we're going to use this old bearing collar you never want to press directly on a bearing you always either want to be pushing on the race or on just this part you don't ever want to push on the cage of a bearing you will stretch it so we'll get this guy jigged up in there kind of held in place i'm going to use an old nut on the end of this shaft thread it a good ways down that way we're not damaging the threads on this guy as we press it on oh. hmm. sorry i threw up in my mouth Drop this other gear on. Then we've got this thrust washer again. Make sure we know which direction the thrust washer is going. Shoulder towards the shaft. And then we've got the, uh, the upgraded bearing. And for that, and we've got this piece of tubing that fits directly over into the ID of the bearing. So we're pressing right into the middle of the bearing. All right, so we got everything pressed in, got everything back over here in the bench, got the shaft put together, have our race seals and front shift rail seals put back in the bearing retainer. So we're gonna put this front bearing retainer together And as before, these bolts are blind into the case, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a little bit of uh, Permatex in the bores of these bolts. You don't gotta get crazy with it. I know a lot of people probably yell at me for using Permatex instead of Thread Sealer, but it does the same thing. It seals the threads, so I don't see a problem with it. Don't tell me how to live my life. And we're gonna drop this guy in. And this one. All right, so we're gonna run some bolts in this front bearing retainer. We're gonna put the set screws in the shift forks with a little bit of Loctite, and then we can put the intermediate gear on, and then we can work on shimming the in play on the front outfoot. Shiny new grade eight hardware always makes me feel better. <sighs> oh yeah, she got some ass on her, boy. That thing is freaking tight. Woo! She ain't jumping out of there no time soon. We're gonna just, we're just doing it. We're doing it. All right, so we've got our front bearing retainer bolted in. We've got a rear bearing plate with just a random shim stack that I've thrown together. The manual specifies zero in play. So we are gonna try to achieve that. And boy, did I make a mess. Give me that back. Thank you. And also by zero in play, I know that's kind of vague. Zero in play with also no preload. So we're actually gonna shim this until we feel in play, and then we're gonna take the in play out of it, if that makes sense. All right, so there we've achieved roughly five thousandths of in play. So I'm gonna take this back off, take one of our Thin his shims out. Recheck it. And see where we're at. And if we zero it out at no in play, I'm gonna call that good. Um, so now we've got the in play worked out. One thing I am gonna do is I'm gonna take this back off. Now with these shim plates, the way they are designed, you're not supposed to use RTV. Um, because obviously anything that you put in between these is going to change the tolerances of the shim. 
So with our preload, so with our preload set, what I'm gonna do is I'm actually gonna take these shims, I'm gonna spray all this down with copper coat and spray each one of these down with copper coat, put these together just to give it something to tack up against that's not really gonna change the tolerance in these shim plates at all. You don't wanna use RTV on these because you can actually change. Um, it would be essentially like adding shims because you're gonna add something in there that's thicker than what the shims are and you're gonna change this measurement that you just achieved. So again, I'm gonna hit these with a bead, with a, a bead. I'm gonna hit these with a coat of copper coat and then we'll put that back together and then we can assemble the intermediate gear and the shaft and all the idler bearings. So, little dab of RTV. And also you'll notice that this cover is painted 2150 red. That will almost double the strength of this transfer case. It's like putting stickers on stuff. If you put stickers on it, it goes faster. 2150 red makes it stronger. So now we're gonna get to the meat and taters of it. So we're gonna place our thrust washers in here. We've got a spacer first. Ouch, that hurt. We're just gonna go ahead and slather some grease in this guy. Don't be scared. First thing we're gonna do is stick this spacer in the bottom. We're gonna set this guy down. And we're gonna take and we're gonna slather some more grease in there. And we just keep on gluing until we've got them all in there. So when you're sufficiently covered with grease and there's grease absolutely everywhere, you're pretty much done. At that point, you're gonna to wanna to move into installing it back into the case. So I'm gonna set you guys here. And we're gonna take this guy and you kind of have to roll it into the case. And you hope that as you're doing it, that you don't knock the thrust washers out and you don't knock any of the needle bearings out. So we're gonna go ahead and get this guy to kind of help throw the rear, th hold the rear thrust washer in place. Two hours later. We gotta throw on the piece de la resistance. I think that's how you say it, I don't know. Even though I'm French Canadian, I don't speak any kind of French, so for what it's worth. Oh man, this is actually what I've been waiting for. This whole build was to put this thing on. Oh man, that's pretty. Yeah, boy. She good, boy. All right, so like I said, we're gonna let this tack up for about an hour, come back, snug all these down, flip it over, and we will throw the twin stick kit on it, which we'll have to take back off. But like I said, this is gonna be kind of a, uh, a desktop, bench top ornament for a bit until I get the rest of the bill going on this truck. So in the meantime, it'll look snazzy sitting here on my workbench. Let's see if this thing will actually shift. We're in, let's see, we're all the way forward. That should be low. All right, and then let's see, we got front.
and high range. All right, YouTube, that wraps us up for this video. I hope you guys enjoyed watching us build this transfer case and stay tuned for some more updates coming as far as our crawler goes. We're definitely gonna be working on that sometime soon. I really don't know when we'll actually pull the truck in and start building it, but definitely components will be getting ready here in the not so distant future. Make sure if you're not already subscribed that you click that subscribe button and the bell icon so you get notifications when new videos are uploaded. Thanks for watching and as always, enjoy.